Hi, I'm Bob in Osterhout. This video is about understanding depression, and that's from one viewpoint, and that's my viewpoint, of course. Uh, I've uh, been treating people with depression for over 36 years, and I, I found some, some common things that work consistently, and that's what I'm going to, uh, to describe and, and to share with you. Uh, I want to be very clear, though, that I'm not a medical doctor. Uh, actually, I'm not a doctor of any kind. I'm a limited licensed psychologist, and I have a master's degree. I'm also a licensed master of social work, but I in no way am I qualified to give any medical advice, and I may comment about medications and such things, uh, but I am not qualified to make any recommendations in that regard, except, of course, to which I did to the to the providers of the people I work with. Uh, also, uh, that I've done no research in this. I've worked in clinic settings where I didn't have access to uh, to doing research. So, uh, what you're going to hear is based on. I don't know, probably over a thousand people that I've treated over that period of time. And uh, what worked has been very consistent in my perception, okay? So it isn't something that I've tested or tried with other places. Uh, so um, take that uh, as, a, as kind of a part of the picture, okay? This isn't, a, there's no absolute truth here. But this is what works for, and how it works from my perspective and from my experience, okay? Uh, the first thing is, is I expect people, based on my experience, to fully recover from every form of depression when they come to my office. Um, that's just, uh, I see people recover and haven't seen people not recover when they follow through on recommendations, and, and that's been a, a consistent experience. Uh, first, a little bit about depression. Um, it's a much misunderstood disorder. Uh, it's not a, a simple identifiable condition like ulcer or strep throat or something like that. I mean, ulcer is a diagnosis that's the cause of the symptoms like a, you know, upset stomach and nausea and things like that. And strep throat would be a diagnosis that's the cause of your throat hurting, okay? But the symptom is your throat hurting. Now, depression is simply the name that's given to a cluster of symptoms, okay? And there's about 15 or so different symptoms of depression. And if you have a certain number of them, then you get a certain diagnosis. And if you have a different number, you get another diagnosis. So the diagnosis is dependent on which symptoms and how many you have. Um, and so one person with depression could have a totally different set of symptoms than another person with depression, okay? So, and there's also a lot of uh, speculation about causes of depression. Uh, there are some people say it's, it's totally a biochemical condition, but uh, there really isn't strong evidence to, to uh, substantiate that because they're only looking at the bio biochemical perspective. And there is a, a biochemical activity in the body for most everything we do. Uh, so you could say there's biochemical activity for hunger and it's only a biochemical condition because you can measure the difference when I'm hungry and when I'm not uh, in the chemicals in your body. But the fact is if I don't eat, I get hungry. So I have, there are things I can do to manage that. And I think there are things that we can do to manage depression, but we need to know that it, understand, it, it involves body, mind, and emotion. And all three are interacting uh, in the symptoms of depression, okay? Um, I won't comment uh, much about medication except for the fact that um, the people I saw were consistently able to get off medication as they made progress uh, if their provider supported that. Now there are some providers who believe that depression is a lifelong disorder and they may have kept their, their patients on depression. But those who did go off medication uh, did not relapse and, and seemed to do pretty well. I also uh, worked with a lot of people who um, never were on medication and were able to fully recover and deal with it. From my experience and the only times I've recommended medication and to, you know, the that the person talked to their provider about it or discussed it myself with their provider or psychiatrist uh, was when they seemed to be in an overwhelming situation and the depression was really interfering with their able, ability to function. So for, for example, a mother who had three children and a full-time job and, and was really having difficulty functioning, the medication seemed to work a, a useful purpose in, in helping her to get through the day. Um, so uh, that, that basically is an issue to be resolved between you and your doctor, and I encourage you to ask a lot of questions about that. Uh, um, from my experience, uh, medications seem to, uh, to slow the recovery process but lessen the pain. Okay, so there's some benefit there, but there's also some costs and some risks, and you want to be well aware of that. Um, I look at depression and understand it as a state of mental, physical, and emotional exhaustion. Okay, it, they're problems with energy, 
okay? Now, there can be medical reasons that will cause all of the symptoms of depression, and it's good to get those checked out first. You want to rule those out because uh, I've been in situations where I've tried to treat people treat people with that and it, it wasn't until I got them in to see their physician and the other cause was identified that uh, they were able to recover. One of the ex examples is, is a thyroid condition that can cause uh, all of the problems that you see in depression and many people are misdiagnosed uh, but once the thyroid is put back into balance or they deal with those issues then the symptoms disappear. It also can uh, result of a side effect of medication or a sleep disorder and once those are corrected then, then the symptoms disappear. So. Uh, I'm talking about uh, the common features of depression uh, that uh, don't have another identifiable physical treatable cause, okay? And those features are, are shallow breathing, patterns of tension, a negative way of looking at life, okay? Recycling what I call conceptual fear, resisting pain and emotion, and an inability to cry deeply without resisting it. Okay, and I'll talk briefly about each one of these, okay? Shallow breathing, almost universally, uh, people who are depressed breathe in the upper part of their lungs, okay? There's an incredible amount of tension, um, and they're, they're holding that in, and their breath is shallow, so they're not getting much oxygen, and that alone can explain some of the symptoms because our body thrives on oxygen. Our blood needs to bring fresh oxygen through every part of our body for us to function adequately, and we're getting a small portion of oxygen, and we're actually working harder to get it than if we're using our whole lungs to breathe, okay? So that's one of the reasons why natural rhythmic breathing or diaphragmatic breathing is very important in the treatment of depression because you're just simply getting more energy and you're getting it much more efficiently and your body doesn't work so hard to get it. The other thing that happens is when you breathe shallow, the carbon dioxide that you breathe out sinks to the bottom of your lungs, okay? And that's heavier than air, so that's why it does that. So you're recycling your exhale, okay? You're not getting fresh energy in and you're working, doing the same amount of work and just not getting anything for it. And, and that's not only depressing, but it leads to the symptoms of depression, okay? The other thing is, is patterns of tension. And these are often very deep and, and they inhibit even movement. So people who are depressed move less and move differently than people who are not depressed. Uh, and they've done studies that have, that have identified this too, and that's a consistent pattern. And under, understanding and resolving those patterns of tension gives us fresh energy because whenever we're tensing, we're using energy. Okay, and when you've got a deficit of energy and you're using up a bunch not for, for, for nothing productive, you know, that, that's interfering with recovery too. So resolving those patterns of tension frees up the energy, gives us uh, more motivation to do something. We feel better. We feel our muscles instead of they become numb when we tense them too much. And numbness is a common feature of depression actually. Okay, the, the next one is, is, I call it a negative filter. Okay, uh, we get pulled toward a negative way of looking at life. And if you think about it, that's a natural process. It's a natural result of the other things that are going on. Because when there's a buildup of tension, okay, the big concern, our body is geared towards survival first. And if the tension is building up, there's a potential for a threat. So our mind is going to ask the question, what's wrong? Now, there is no threat because it's coming from tension that's building up, maybe even from our thinking, uh, so we can find something that's wrong. There's always something that's wrong, okay? And so what depression does, when the tension builds up, it narrows our focus and pulls us toward focusing on what's wrong, and we'll find something that's wrong. I don't have enough money. I'm afraid I'm going to fail. This isn't going to work. There's a number of things we can focus on, and when we think about those things, we create more tension. So you've got a self-escalating process, okay, uh, where everything is pulling your mind in dire your direction and your mind is pushing it further in the same direction, okay? The next one is to, is to recycle what I call conceptual fear. And I, and I use that word because it's different than what I consider basic fear. Uh, if a bear uh, is out of its pen and growling at me, I'm afraid, and so are you and everybody else, okay, unless they're a good friend of the bear and know him well, okay. So there's a natural fear in a, in a, a threatening situation that needs to run its course. It's simply a natural emotion, and the video on emotions will explain that in, in more detail how that works. Conceptual fear comes from our thoughts. Thinking about what could happen, or maybe what I didn't do well enough, or what could go wrong, or a thousand different forms of ways that we can build up tension by thinking about fear. And the bottom line is conceptual fear serves no useful purpose. 
okay? And so as you get your body into balance and learn to control your thinking through the techniques uh, that are described in some of the other videos, uh, particularly diaphragmatic breathing and clearing your mind and meditation and grounding, uh, then you're able to recognize that, oh, I'm thinking about fear. I'm creating the fear with my thoughts. That's not helpful. Okay, so then you can look at the situation. Well, if I do this, then what happens? You can look at it in, in a clearer way, less attached to, to the outcome because it's not a survival issue in terms of your body, mind, and emotions anymore. It's simply a problem that you need to solve in your life. Possibly a very serious problem, but you're better, much more prepared to solve that problem if you don't have that conceptual fear locking you up. Okay? The other, uh, which is uh, pretty clear cut uh, from my experience, is that people with depression tend to resist pain, they, especially emotional pain. Okay? They don't want to feel the pain. It often, that's how a breakup of a relationship will turn into depression. So someone feels deeply hurt that they've, they've lost this relationship and they just tense up and don't let themselves feel the hurt. Now the video on emotion explains this process in detail and how it works, but basically the, the emotional part of our brain, the part of our brain that processes emotions, takes information actually from our musculature. And if we tense our muscles, you don't get information about what's going there. It actually blocks the experience of emotion. This is most obvious in crying. Okay, Someone who's crying and is, try is resisting the crying does some variation of this. They're going <laughs> They're tensing, holding their breath. It actually works. It stops the emotion. They stop feeling it, but now you got all this tension, and that's a big contributing factor to the depression. And what I've noticed consistently over 36 years is when people are able to maintain natural rhythmic breathing and cry deeply without tensing, I don't see any symptoms of depression anymore. When they're able to do that on a, on a regular basis, on a repeated basis. Okay, I mean, that doesn't mean you have to make someone cry, obviously, but those tears that would come up naturally because of emotions that have been held in through that time. And whenever they're able to let them go, then the temporary nature of emotion uh, means that it doesn't stay with us and, and we may feel deeply hurt for a while, but then we are doing something else and we're not thinking about it and that emotion is passed. And we may feel it again when something reminds us of it, but then it passes. So that's a healthy, normal thing, feelings of the sadness or hurt or, or any uncomfortable emotion emotion, but if we resist it, we're putting it ourselves for risk for emotion and or for depression. And if we're depressed, uh, it's very important to allow ourselves to fully experience the emotions and not to resist them. And so that inability to cry without resistance is another just very common feature that I see in just about every depressed person that, I, that I've worked with. And so uh, just letting go. And, and so I simply say, put your feet flat, relax your shoulders. Keep breathing and allow the tears to come, okay? It deepens then. It hurts more for a little while because you're not blocking the pain. But the important thing to remember is that hurt never lasts more than a few minutes, okay? It tends to come in waves, okay? If you're recovering from, from some real difficult situation, you'll get hit with a wave of sadness or hurt. You breathe, you ground, it passes in a, in a number of seconds, and you'll hit with another wave at another time. Uh, when you get the tension levels down initially, when you re clear what I call the surface tension uh, by practicing the techniques that are described in the other videos, uh, then those emotions only tend to come up when you're in a time and place to handle it. They don't come up while you're shopping or at work or something like that. Now, if you're using tension to hold them, not hold them down, they can come out anywhere and it compounds the problem and adds embarrassment to all the other problems that you're, that you're struggling to deal with. Okay? So, so the recovery process from depression involves regular practice of the natural rhythmic breathing or the diaphragmatic breathing. Uh, that's generally six to ten times a day for two to four weeks, figuring about three to five minutes per time. You don't have to time it, but, but that number of times is important to restore balance to the autonomic nervous system uh, and to clear out the patterns of tension and to be aware of and resolve the patterns of tension. So if you're holding your shoulders up all the time, you learn to drop them. You raise them up, you bring them back, you drop them. Now the shoulders are more in their natural position. I feel them come up, I drop them again. Okay, I'm aware of that it doesn't build up and I just let it go before it goes anywhere. Okay? Able to experience deep emotion without a resistance. I think I explained uh, pretty completely. 
the importance also of being able to recognize and redirect unhelpful thoughts, okay? And the, the video on clearing your mind explains that in some detail. And the video on depression, or I'm sorry, on, um, on meditation uh, provides a technique that is very useful in developing the skill of being aware of where your thoughts are taking you and choosing where you want them to go. So uh, once you've developed that freedom of thinking, uh, you're free in many aspects of your life because you, you can go where you want to go and your mind isn't taking you places where you don't want to go. Okay. Uh, another thing that, that's common in recovery and an important step is making clear decisions. We, we're in charge of our own life. We're deciding what we want to do, when we want to do it, to the extent that we're able to do that. Of course, there are always limitations and, and unforeseen circumstances. And then the other part is that we're able to view things and situations from different perspectives. Um, one other uh, factor that's common to depression uh, is that people tend to become more self-focused, more self-centered when they're depressed. They're, 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 they don't have any energy to reach out and it's like you pull in and you're just looking at yourself and thinking about yourself and focusing about how miserable you are and it, it just gets us more wrapped up with ourselves and part of the recovery process of depression is being able to reach out again and to, and to engage life and become part of life and to enjoy it. Okay, I hope that offers you some uh, helpful insight on depression. Uh, good luck to you.